All right, you guys did it. You made it through last week. Pretty crazy week. At one point, if I go over to my Instagram here, I posted this. This is on Monday after I posted that uh, dividends during a recession video. Yeah, we had some headlines come out. That's what I mean talking about. And headlines a lot of times drive markets to do things. And one of them is they can make the market go down a lot pretty quickly. This is a 1.7% drop in my portfolio, $785 gone in a couple hours. So I'm gonna be talking about this, my thoughts on this type of thing happening. That's gonna be the first subject I cover. The next thing is version two of the dividend tracking graphs. I've made some changes to it, simplified a few things, as well as uh, added in another graph here of total portfolio value. And then you can see things look a little bit different. So I'll be talking about this as well. And then of course, the last thing is just answering your guys' questions. We got some different comments and questions that I'm gonna to respond to, so stick around for that as well. Now, in order to introduce this entire idea of a headline investor, I wanna take a look at last week, beginning with August 1st, because a lot of headlines happened. And we can take a look at the reaction that some people had to it. Let's start off with President Trump showing his dissatisfaction with how President Xi is handling this trade war. I think President Xi, who's somebody I like a lot, I think he wants to make a deal, but frankly, he's not going fast enough. He said he was gonna be buying from our farmers. He didn't do that. He said he was going to stop fentanyl from coming into our country. It's all coming out of China. Now, of course, Trump continues on saying that he's growing impatient with China, that they're dragging their feet, and he wants to speed this whole process along, these trade negotiations. So what tool does he use to apply pressure to China? The same thing that he's used many times before. Trump says the U.S. will impose 10% tariffs on another $300 billion of Chinese goods starting September 1st. This is bad headline number one. Let's see where this starts going. On August 4th, the Dow plunges 760 points in worst trading day in 2019 as the trade war intensifies. If we go down, they actually cite a reason why. China, which has historically controlled its currency, allowed it to fall to its lowest levels on Monday against the dollar in more than a decade. And you can guess where that bad headline leads to. Another bad headline. You wake up the next morning and it says the U.S. designates China as a currency manipulator. So, I mean, Trump has tweeted about this many times and many other presidents have said it previously as well. But now we're officially labeling China as a currency manipulator. So this whole thing continues on until we get full circle back to our portfolios. After all that news, all these events that have happened just in a very slow amount of time, just going through that, it feels like that's a year's worth of news. That's just a few days. And we go back to this and I look at my week view, I'm in the green. The S&P 500 is in the green this week after all that bad news. But in the meantime, the, the stock market went up and down like crazy. A lot of people react to news. That's just the nature of it. Investopedia has a name for this. It's called the headline effect. They say, whether it's justified or not, the investing public's reaction to a headline can be very dramatic, such that the public's reaction to bad news in the headlines can be out of proportion when compared with the reaction to good news in the headlines. Um, it goes on and talks about this effect a lot more and, and studies it throughout time. But it's pretty much saying this, that any bad news will have these severe swings in the market, these reactions, and it's something you have to get used to. It's not something new either. This effect has been around for a very long time. In fact, I'll go ahead and throw this up on the screen. This is some pages out of the book written by Peter Lynch, who's a, a legendary investor. It's called Beating the Street. Now, I won't read through all of these because it's a lot of different headlines, but what Peter Lynch did is he tried to recreate the mood, the investor sentiment for the, 19, the year 1990. This was a year full of really, really bad headlines. Layoffs this time hit professional ranks with unusual force. That's from the Wall Street Journal. How safe is your job? Newsweek. Scraping by New York Times. The real estate bust. Newsweek. High rents could be keeping young from setting up house. Business week. Housing slump hammering home remodelers. So on and so forth. There's like two dozen of them that he lists off here. This is bad headline after bad headline. And the point was, is Peter Lynch wanted to show that if you pay attention to these headlines, it's not going to serve you that well. I'll read one paragraph from the next page. He says, of course, we know now that the war wasn't as terrible as some had expected unless you were in Iraq. And what we got from the stock market instead of a 33% drop was a 30% gain in the S&P 500 average, a 25% gain in the Dow, and a 60% gain in smaller stocks, which added up to making 1991 the best year in two decades. You would have missed it all had you paid the slightest attention to your celebrated prognostications. Now that's Peter Lynch giving the advice that if you had listened to all those terrible headlines in 1990, you would have missed out on all the amazing gains in 1991. 
And he's not the only legendary investor to have this advice, to somewhat ignore the headlines, to try to remove yourself from that headline effect. We have Warren Buffett here. He's in an interview. This is on CNBC. And he's asked, what should investors make of this whole trade war thing? It seems like it's escalating. There's lots of talks of recessions. The Dow Jones seems very unstable. What is your take, Warren Buffett? And he gives his answer here. If you own a farm and you're worried about selling your farm because you read the newspaper this morning, or if you own a a perfectly decent business in your town and you're worried about selling your you think you should worry about selling your business today because of that, then you should think about about selling stocks but if you look at stocks as businesses that you own little pieces of why in the world should you uh, sell it based on on headlines of any sort uh, it's nonsense to get feeling good or bad about what stock prices do in a day unless you have extra money and they go down and then you feel better because you can buy more of them cheaper. Now, I don't think that it's coincidence that two of the best investors to ever live, Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch, that they have really similar advice on this subject. They have different ways of talking about it, but they both pretty much say to focus on the companies that you own, don't try to predict the future, you'll probably cause more harm than you will good, and don't sell stocks based off of headlines. That's pretty much their advice on the subject. So that's what I've tried to do with this portfolio. I've tried to avoid being a headline investor, avoid making decisions of the day based off of headlines. I think that you can look at overall trends. You can see that we're in the 11th year of a bull market. We have the yield curve inverting. We have all these things kind of happening that make me be a little bit more conservative than I would otherwise be, but I'm still going to be invested. I still want to be able to participate in the market. I don't know when we're going to hit a recession or any kind of bear market. Nobody knows when that's going to happen, but what I've done is built a portfolio that I'm fine going into that with. I can see this portfolio drop and know that I own really good companies that I'm okay holding throughout a recession. So that's what I've tried to do with my portfolio. Now, I just wanted to go through that, talk about headline investing because we're getting a lot of headlines the past week, but I want to go ahead and move on to my month's performance. I haven't updated you guys on how much I earned in the month of July. If I go over here, these are the different graphs that I keep track of my progress, my investing progress. And this is a free Google Sheet spreadsheet that I made with a buddy. I'm letting you guys use it for free so you can make a copy for yourself, plug in your own data, and you can track all your own information the exact same way. Just as a reminder, to be able to make a copy, you go to the description. It'll say Google Sheets Dividend Tracker right here on the video if you scroll down. And what you do is you open that up, then go to File, Make a Copy. File, Make a Copy. Don't ask for permission to edit it. I'm not going to let you edit the original. Go ahead and make yourself a copy, and then you can use that. Now, I want to jump into some of these graphs here. This is the first one, my actual monthly income. This is since I started this portfolio way back in January of 2018. You can see my first two months, I didn't earn anything in dividends. That's because of the lag time there is before you put your money in, get through that first ex-dividend date, and then the payout day, all of that stuff. So once I got to March, I started earning dividends. Then you can see them gradually go up until it gets all the way to here. Last month in July, I hit my record high dividend amount, $166.05. Before that, the month before June was $143. So that's two pretty good months in a row. If I scroll over here, I can actually see my average monthly dividend, and you can see the actual income graphed over that. So these blue bars here, these are my averages, and then on top of it is my actual. So last month was 166, but my average, which shows up in this asterisk here, this one shows you the current month, is $152. So right now, my portfolio on average is generating $152 a month. That's what this Google spreadsheet is telling me. If I go down here, I can see my average yearly income. This one's very simple. It's just your average monthly times 12. So 1,630 is what I'm earning on average every year. And then I added in one more graph here on the bottom right, my portfolio value. I debated whether to add this one in or not, but I thought it is a really motivating thing to see your portfolio grow over time. So month to month, it continues to go up. Um, it's pretty linear right now because I just consistently add money to it every month. But as this portfolio grows in value, the money I'm adding is a smaller portion of the overall portfolio value here. And eventually it's going to get to the point where my contributions aren't affecting it quite as much. So we'll see it be a little bit more jagged here. So that's the basics of it. I have these four different graphs. I think they're all really good indicators. I have my average monthly income, average yearly income, my overall portfolio value, and then my actual monthly income going up and down. And I think it's pretty awesome to be able to track these things. This is exactly how I like to see it. So you guys, again, this is free. You can use it if you want to. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. If you wanna build different graphs based off of this information, you can do that too. 
uh, lots of cool things you can do with this. So I changed this here so you can easily update the sheet. And then we made some adjustments to the formula to make it a little bit better for different portfolios that get paid out at different times. So like I said, I'll go ahead and link this in the description and you guys can have fun. Give me feedback on it. I guess we'll keep improving it over time and see what happens with it. Okay, so I'm going to move on to questions, and I want to preface this first question that I got. After I did my last video doing that comparison chart of market cap to dividend payments, um, it, it showed that a lot of people have a fundamental misunderstanding of how dividend yield works, how dividend payments work. I got a lot of questions that showed that people don't grasp this subject. So if you're new to dividend investing, if you're somewhat researching about this and learning about this, please listen to this first question. I really want to get this cleared up. I'll go through and read a couple of the comments left on that video. Adam says, Joseph, isn't it incorrect to say that dividends remain the same as if the stock price goes down and the dividend amount paid reduces also? So if the share price falls 50%, so does your dividend payment. Uh, Trading with James says, stating that dividends remain the same or go up for the most part is a little misleading because yes, you're still getting payments. However, 3% on $50 isn't the same as 3% on $100. The percentage is the same, but the payments are very different. Just feels like people won't understand this. Smooth1330 says, if your portfolio is cut in half, wouldn't your dividend income also get cut in half since the dividend is based off the stock value? Um, that last one there, he asked the question in the most clear way. He's saying, if my portfolio value were to drop 50%, wouldn't my dividend payments drop 50% because a dividend is based off of the portfolio value? That is totally erroneous. So I'm not trying to pick on you guys. This is a super common thing that I, I see new investors fall into. Dividend payments are not based off of the market cap. They are a set dollar amount. In fact, let me go to the draw board to illustrate this. Let's take a company like Apple. And for the sake of math to keep things simple, these aren't real numbers, but let's say that Apple decides it's gonna pay a $3 dividend. So they pay out $3 per share per year. And let's say that the share price conveniently right now is $100 per share. So we have a share price of $100 on top. We have the $3 dividend on bottom. That would make the current yield of this stock 3%. That would be the current dividend yield. This is where people get confused about this. Apple does not set a 3% dividend yield. All that is is a calculation based off of the amount they did set, this $3, and their share price. But as their share price ebbs and flows, as it goes up and down every single day, this dividend yield changes. It changes from 3% to 3.5 to 2.5 or whatever. In fact, if we go into, let's say we go into a recession and Apple's share price gets cut in half. So now we have a share price of $50 per share. How much is Apple gonna pay you per share? They're gonna pay $3 per share unless they decide themselves to cut the dividend. The dividend is not a set yield. That is simply the calculation based off of the current share price. If the share price goes down, the dividend yield go up. So a $3 dividend a year on a $50 price is gonna be a 6% yield. So you can see a lot of people get this confused. They think that a company like sets a dividend percentage and then you get paid out whatever percentage that is, that's not how it works. A company sets a specific dollar amount that they pay out per year, and they pay it out quarterly, and whatever the current price of the share is determines this dividend yield. The dividend yield changes all the time. That's why a lot of investors, if there's temporary drops in prices, you can pick shares up for better values and get that 6% yield. Then when it goes back up to $100 per share, it'll be back at that 3% yield. That's called yield on cost. So. Uh, don't get confused about this. Know that if my portfolio were to drop 50% in value and none of the companies actively cut their dividends, I would still maintain that $160 a month income. I'd still maintain the exact same income I have right now. The companies would have to actively cut their dividend for my income to go down. So I just wanted to clear that up for you guys because I know that there's some people that are still confused by that. Okay, so let me move on to the next question. It says, hello, I just found your YouTube channel and I've watched a bunch of your videos. I'm really new to dividend investing and would like to get your opinion. I have been using Robinhood to buy dividend stocks and I'm not sure if this is the way to go. I noticed you used M1 and would like to know if that is a better option. I know M1 allows you to purchase partial shares, which is a huge bonus. I just would like to know your opinion if I should move my $100 off of Robinhood to M1. I also use Acorns and Betterment and would like to know the difference between all three of these. Thanks so much. 
All right, let me just say, I think it's awesome that at least in the US right now, we have a lot of options of really great brokers to pick from. So instead of just having the traditional brokers that have gotten away with charging huge fees over the years and charging for everything that they do, I like that these new brokers are coming out and they're leveraging new technology to make trades free. And that's already been shown to bring down the price of trades all across the board. I think it's similar to what ETFs have done to mutual funds. Mutual funds, you used to have to buy these actively managed funds and pay like 1% to 1.5% management fees. And now you have ETFs that are a tenth of the cost. They're 0.2%, 0.3% for ETFs. So I see these new brokers like M1 and Robinhood, they're doing the same thing to the traditional ones. As these ones grow and get bigger and bigger, they're going to put downward pricing pressure on those more traditional brokers. So I think that's a really cool thing. Now, having said that, between Robinhood and M1, it really depends on what style of investing you're doing. The biggest benefit of Robinhood is that you can buy and sell stocks anytime. Anytime that you want, you can put in an order. Within five minutes, it's going to be purchased or sold. With M1, there's one trading window a day. So M1 is not the platform to use if you anticipate wanting to do a lot of intraday buying and selling. If you want to buy stock in the, the morning and sell it a couple hours later, and then buy stock in the evening, sell it you know the next morning. If you're trying to do that, where you buy and sell very frequently, if you want to do day trading or things like that, then M1 is not the broker to use. M1 fits with an investing style that I like more, which is not an investing style where I buy and sell intraday. In fact, I mean, this whole video, I'm talking about how I don't really like that style of investing. I don't buy and sell based off of headlines. I'm not going to be buying and selling all the time really frequently. I think M1 has some pretty big benefits. Like you mentioned, it has fractional shares. Another thing is it has a pretty awesome system for organizing your portfolio. You might have noticed how mine's broken up into different sectors. I picked out my individual holdings in those, and then it keeps it in balance. It puts all the cash flow and dividends into the underweight holdings and keeps it in balance there. So that's probably the biggest benefits of M1. Another thing that I like about M1 is that it has retirement account support, so I can put my Roth IRA in there as well. It makes it really convenient. So you just have to decide, I mean, which one you enjoy using best. This strategy of dividend growth investing can be done on any broker. You can do it on Schwab, you can do it on Vanguard, you can do it on Robinhood. The only brokers you probably can't do this strategy on are just strictly robo-advisors. Like you can't do it on Acorns, you can't do it on Betterment because they don't allow any flexibility in their portfolios. They're just templated portfolios that you have to use. So Robinhood, you can still do a dividend growth investing strategy. Um, you're just going to be limited by those full share prices. So with $100, you could sell it and move it over to M1. I mean, I like using my M1 account. You can see how it functions. You can see all your Robinhood functions and decide for yourself which one you want to use. To be quite frank, though, at the very beginning, I don't think what broker you're using is going to be the biggest factor in how successful you are. It's going to be your budgeting. It's going to be how much you deposit. That's going to be a way bigger factor in how successful you are. So as far as a broker, it's going to be largely your preference. I prefer M1. Other people might prefer Robinhood or they might stick with their Vanguard account. All of that's, all of that's good. It's whatever one works best for you. All right. John says, hi, Joseph. Love your videos. I'm 67 years old with a nest egg in an Edward Jones account and also some in Robinhood. Thinking of moving everything gradually to M1 for dividend investing and keeping 30000 around to just trade in Robinhood for fun. I signed up with M1 and put 3000 in it to kick the tires. I really love it and the dividend strategy. I started out with nine pies. My 3000 is currently, after a couple days, showing a balance of now $3,023. And on my holding screen, it shows that it has a gain of 0.78%, which is accurate. But on the home screen, it shows it as money weighted value of 1.29%. Could you explain this in one of your videos in plain English? I've looked it up in Investopedia and it just ended up scratching my head. It appears that the larger figure makes it look like you are doing better than you actually are. Keep up the good work. Love your videos. God bless. All right, John, so you ask a good question. This is a really popular one. There's actually quite a bit of debate about this. A lot of people want to see their return in specific ways. I'll go ahead and I'll explain what money-weighted return is. So if we go here, we have the formula of money-weighted return. And I think it's crystal clear. Like, I don't know how it can get much more clear than this. Okay, I'm only joking. If you're just watching this, I mean, it's an extremely complex formula. I don't know how anybody could really figure this out by looking at it. But regardless, I've looked at what this does and, and studied about it. Money-weighted return is often referred to as personal return because unlike a simple return where you just take the dollar amount of gain, you know, you look into how many, how, what percentage that is of the amount that you've contributed and that factors in return. 
With simple return, my actual percentage return would be about 9, 9, 10%, somewhere around there. That would be the simple weighted return. But that wouldn't really be accurate to my performance because every time I add money, my simple return would go down. So if I have uh, $4,500 in gains, my portfolio is at $47,000 and I have a simple return of like $9,000, right? Let's say I deposit $50,000 into my portfolio. What happens to your simple return? It would effectively get cut in half. That 9% return right here would turn into like a, a 5% return, a 4% return, just by you depositing more money. So that's not really an accurate indicator of what your performance is. What money weighted return does is it makes it so that future deposits, when you add money to your portfolio, it doesn't diminish your return. Meaning that your return um, is a kind of a storyline of how your actual performance is doing. The reason that mine's at 26%, even though I only have $4,500 of gains compared to $47,000 of total portfolio value, the reason it's 26% is because a lot of the returns that I made were early on in investing when I only had four or $5,000. And so this keeps track of my performance. I performed really good over the first year of investing when I had a lower dollar amount. So money weighted return stated simply takes into account the amount of money you had invested when you made that return. Simple return, the simple calculation of this amount and what percentages of the amount that you contributed, that does not take into account how much money you had when you made the return. Every time you add money, it'll lower that percentage of simple return. Every time I add money to this portfolio, it's not going to automatically just lower this percentage. This percentage will go up or down based off my performance and my performance only. So whatever one you prefer, uh, I mean, that's up to you. A lot of people prefer the simple return. I think money weighted return is pretty cool because it actually does track your performance. I like the fact that I could put in $10,000 and my 26% wouldn't just be reduced just by depositing money. I don't think it's fair that when you simply deposit money into your account, your return gets reduced. So uh, I prefer money weighted return, but other people have different viewpoints on it and that's fine too. All right, so I'm going to end this one here. Uh, be sure to do all the usual things like subscribe, follow me on all the social media, and I'll catch you guys next time. You have a good one.